Good morning, everyone. Okay, nice. Um, good to be back here. And uh, let's pray and begin with our class for this morning. Let's pray together. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for adding another um, day, a week into our lives. Father, thank you for the privilege of uh, studying your word, Lord. Uh, Father God, as we spend time in your word, help us, Lord, to um, Lord take it in. And uh, Lord, let the word of God, the seed of your word, be sown in good ground, Lord, that it can bear fruit uh, for the glory of your name. Thank you, Father God, for uh, your powerful word and um, the fact that it is working in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's uh, get to chapter 6, where we will read a pattern of prayer that Jesus gave us. So the disciples, they go to Jesus and uh, they ask him to teach them how to pray. We've said this earlier. Uh, I, I think so. If we haven't, it's fine. So generally, we ask someone to tell us what they know best. For example, we may go to a musician and say, can you talk a little bit about how you learned to play this instrument? Uh, how do you... You know, uh, how do you prepare yourself each time you have to perform? So we ask them from their learning, from their experience. Now, if I want to take help for technology, I'll go to somebody who knows technology. And I'll tell them, please teach me how to do this. So we are looking for people who are good at something to ask them regarding that particular subject. The disciples, they went and asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. So what does this tell us about Jesus and prayer? See, they could have asked Jesus anything. They could have asked Jesus, Jesus, how do we, you know, how do we understand scripture? Many things. Yeah. Even that Jesus was well versed in scripture, but they particularly came and asked him, teach us about prayer, how to pray. So it shows us that Jesus led a life strong in prayer. No wonder they felt that they have to ask him about prayer. If he did not lead a life of prayer, then they should not ask because Jesus is not leading a life of prayer. Got it. But they asked him specifically, Jesus, teach us how to pray. So it tells us a lot about Jesus. We've already seen how he woke up early in the morning, how he prayed the whole night, how he took time out to go and pray. So personal time with the father, speaking with the father was very important for Jesus. Okay. So that shows us that we too have to develop that kind of a life of prayer. He was the son of God. So he could have easily excused himself and said, everyone else pray, but I am the son of God. But he never did that. He, he um, you know, you could say labored, worked hard, or whichever way you want to put it. But he was doing what was required to do. That is a life of prayer. So when the disciples asked him to teach them how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, there is a passage which many term as the Lord's Prayer. People call it the Lord's Prayer, but we'll, we'll look at it. So here he taught them how to pray. Can someone read it loudly? Can please take the mic and read Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13. In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, yes. hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Okay. So here is the pattern. We said that people call it the Lord's Prayer. 
some people say that you should not call it the Lord's Prayer, you should call it the Disciples' Prayer because Jesus taught it to the disciples. So whatever we call it, it's a good pattern for us to understand. Once Jesus taught this prayer, what people have started doing is uh, repeating it because Jesus taught us the prayer. So what should we do? Yeah, repeat it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like Whether we think about it or we don't think about it, what we tend to do is just repeat it. So is that a good thing? No? Why? Why not? Mike. Mike, Mike, please. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And it's like that prayer was what what I read in my understanding uh, when I was like studying. So this prayer is for that time only, uh, what I feel. And now when we are in Christ, when we are saved, uh, there is a little bit dis uh, like, uh, what I say, different prayer we should do. Okay. Rather than. Fine. So, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for the insight. What Prem is saying is, this was for the older times when Jesus taught the people. It was only for that time. Now we can pray a different prayer. Okay, so my question was, if we repeat the prayer, is it good or not good? Good, not good, not good. I'm getting confused. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. So some people are saying it's good. Uh, some are saying not good. So let's look, consider it this way. If we are only repeating some prayers, what is prayer? Talking to God. Okay. Yeah, relationship. So if it's just like, you know, something that's uh, a repetition, like we are meeting uh, somebody, our friends, we don't learn things by heart and just repeat it at them, right? How are you? How, how was your day? This, that. Just repeat, repeat, repeat. When there's no heart in it, you can't really have a relationship. So with repetition. So that's the problem. There's nothing wrong with the prayer. It's a good prayer. Every time we pray it with meaning, it makes sense. But if there is no meaning, if I just repeat it a hundred times, but I don't mean it a hundred times, then it doesn't really help in any way. So that's the problem. The prayer is a good prayer. Whenever we mean it, it is useful. But if we don't mean it, then it is not useful. So how should we apply this? This is the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples when they wanted to learn about prayer. So we can't, we can't ignore this prayer, but how do we actually use it? Okay. So what we can do is, when we see this prayer, there is a pattern. There is a pattern. We will follow the pattern, but we will not use it like a parrot. You uh, learn it and repeat it. Not like that. Follow the pattern. So even when what Prem said, he's saying it, it was meant for that time. That's fine. Uh, however, the pattern is something that we can follow till today. Okay, so what is the pattern? We look at it. It's already been given in our notes. If you flip the pages, you'll understand it. It's quite... Um, uh, clear. The first part of the pattern where Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. For the first time, Jesus called God Father. Till that time, Yahweh God for the, for the Jews and the Pharisees. They saw God as almighty and somewhat impersonal. They couldn't think of God as a father. So even when Jesus called God as father, it was problematic for the Jews. They thought, how can you? How can you call God father? 
But that is how Jesus taught us to pray. So what is the first thing we need for prayer? Our Father. Meaning, understand that we have a relationship with God. God is our Father. It's very powerful. So when I go to God in prayer, if I'm going like, He's there, I'm here, you know, I'm scared, I'm quickly going and saying what I need. I'm not understanding the relationship that God has given. Okay, with Him. He's saying, you pray like this. Our Father. It breaks every barrier, breaks every wall, breaks every hindrance. It's amazing that you can call God, Creator God, Abba Father. First time the Jews are hearing this, what are you saying? Is this how we are supposed to pray? Oh, thou almighty God. Nothing wrong with it. We can say it. But still, know that God is our Father. That's how Jesus said. Our Father who art in heaven. That one line, so much is there in that. Think of this. He didn't say, my Father. My Father. Nothing wrong with that. There are places where Jesus addresses personally. What is our father? Our father means as much as I acknowledge that God is my father, I acknowledge that people are my brothers and sisters, other believers, right? We are in the body of Christ. I'm not independent, you know, I'm not all by myself here. Okay, relationship with God is there. That's all that matters. I don't care about others. It doesn't work like that. Our father means we are all together. We have a relationship with each other. It's both vertical and horizontal relationship. As much as I respect God, I honor God, I have to respect my brothers. I have to respect my sisters. I have to respect the family of God. Because He is our Father. He's my Father and He's also your Father. I cannot disregard my relationships. Okay, so that's what our understanding is. So, our Father in heaven. So the Trinity, we'll see references to the Trinity in many passages of scripture. Jesus is calling out to God. That means there are two persons, at least in this section, two persons. Jesus is talking to another person. This is a mystery. The Trinity is very hard for us to understand with our limited minds. We have three persons. Right? God is three persons um, and uh, all are co-equal. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. In this passage, we see God the Father and Jesus. So Jesus is speaking to the Father. Something different. The Jews couldn't understand all this. They were like, what is he talking? Our Father in heaven. What is all this? But Jesus is giving us truth. And he's saying we have a relationship with God as our father. We have a relationship with each other and our heavenly father or God the father. Where is he? He is in heaven. He's in heaven. So when we study about each person of the Trinity, we'll understand the ministry of each person in the Trinity. So uh, God the father is in heaven. Jesus at that point was on the earth. Where is Jesus now? In heaven, at the right hand of the Father. Where is the Holy Spirit now? Yeah, He's on the earth. He's in us. He's with us. So each person of the Godhead has a ministry. They are independent. But they do their part. And they do their part well. That's what we see about the Godhead. So that first line. Uh, why are we learning this pattern? You know, as we understand it, we can take each part and spend time in it. For example, if I pray, I'm just using the pattern. I'm not repeating our Father in heaven. I'm just using the, uh, the meaning of each part. So the first part I understood, I need to acknowledge my relationship with the Father. Okay, so it may take me five minutes. It may take me 10 minutes. It may take me one hour to just express my relationship with the Father. Okay. And it also says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. So how does Jesus begin the prayer? He's teaching us to start praying by giving glory to God. That's how we should start our prayer. 
I magnify your name, O God. I praise you, O Lord. You know, we adore you. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, different things. We glorify you. Uh, Lord, we honor you. Hallowed be thy name. Oh, glory be to your name. We always glorify God. Why did God create us? Why did he create you and me? Yeah, for to glorify him. That's the primary reason that we exist. That's the reason we exist. And everything that we have, he created it and designed it so that we can bring glory to his name. So even when we pray, we begin by glorifying him. We say, hallowed be your name. <laughs> this, <coughs> excuse me. Giving of glory could take, as I've been saying, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour. Who knows? Right? So in our daily pattern, what we are saying is, understand the meaning of each part. And even if we spend, let's say, uh, one hour in prayer, five, five minutes we can use for everything. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Five minutes. You just spend worshiping the Lord, praising him and glorifying him. Let's go to the second line here. It says... Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how do we understand this? Your kingdom. In the second year course, we have uh, a publication which is called The Kingdom of God. A full book. So we'll try to understand what is the kingdom of God. In simple terms, kingdom means the rule, reign, and authority of God. Okay, the rule of God, the authority of God. You know, we can consider different parts of the world and think about a nation which is ruled very well. They have great infrastructure. They have uh, good educational opportunities. People are thriving. There's a lot of investment for business. Uh, there's progress, there's prosperity. Why? There's good rule, good reign, isn't it? So that is why people are able to achieve those things. Now think about maybe a part of the world where there is uh, uh, no leadership or there is uh, some sort of a dictatorship and people don't have a voice. Things are not working out very well. Those kind of places tend to struggle. Because they're not able to invest into all of these good things. Why? The rule and reign is not very good. But what are we saying? When we study about the kingdom of God, we will understand that God's rule is the best. Compared to anything that we have ever seen here on earth, the way our God rules is the highest and the best. So when we say, your kingdom come, we are saying, God, we want your rule, your reign to come. Your kingdom come. Okay? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what we understand from this is, in heaven, two things are happening. One is the kingdom of God or the rule and reign of God. How is heaven? What is our... Uh, understanding of heaven from scripture? Yes, the place God has made for us. Is it a good place? It's an awesome place, isn't it? We would all love to be there. There's no tears. There's no sickness. There's no uh, quarrels. There's peace. Um, there's no death. It's a wonderful place. It's a happy place. Why? Because God rules and reigns in heaven. Our Father in heaven. In heaven, it's perfect. The setting is perfect. God's decision is amazing. Everything that happens in heaven, there is peace, there is joy, there is um, prosperity, there is creativity. Talk about anything that is good. It is there in heaven. Why? Because God is ruling. God is reigning. Reigning is another way to say ruling. So God's rule and reign is in heaven. There is no interference of Satan in heaven. No. Only on earth. He's still doing his work. But there's no interference of Satan in heaven. And so it is perfect. 
what are we praying we are praying and we're saying god on earth as it is in heaven are you all understanding so jesus is teaching us to pray we want earth to be like heaven peace joy prosperity blessing divine health talk about the good things let it come down on earth as it is in heaven the kingdom let it come on earth the will of god the will of god is what is happening in heaven no wonder it's thriving so if the will of god happens here on the earth we will thrive we will be blessed yeah mike please yeah yes ma'am when we pray like can you give us the example how we are proclaiming this thing that your kingdom come um, yes yeah so i was just going to go to that in our notes you can see many different um, things that concern us so there is a family there is home there is health for those who are married a husband or wife children finances our work our ministry you know many many such things so what we need to do is we can pray and say let your kingdom come in my if you take for example um your work let your kingdom come let your will be done in my work oh god that's how i will pray yes correct so yeah so instead of you can say i hand over to you that's one way of praying you can also say you come into it come into my work oh god or come into my uh, if your problems are specific to home or specific to finances specific to health we can say god let your kingdom come in my work let your kingdom come in my home let let your kingdom come uh, in my finances like that so each one we can take time to declare the kingdom of god so meaning let the good things of heaven take place in all these areas so that is uh, you know a way of directing the prayers personally to us personally to us and our family but we can also pray let your kingdom come in my church what does that mean lord let there be uh, you know knowledge understanding of the word of god let there be unity among the people let there be supernatural healings miracles signs wonders let there be a flow of the holy spirit let there be no oppression of the devil so i'm praying for my ministry i'm praying for my church like that okay or we can pray for our organization if you are the head of an organization you can pray for your organization and ask for the rule and reign of god in your organization or uh, like this you can keep extending city let your rule come in my city oh god so this yeah? is the same thing if we pray lord give us your wisdom and knowledge so this is the this is also the same thing yeah it's sort of the same thing yeah uh, if you say give us your knowledge and wisdom you're asking for those uh, kingdom virtues kingdom it's virtues. fine okay. it's fine okay so uh, we can spend some time in asking for the kingdom of god to come into every area of our lives we might need 10 minutes 20 minutes to just keep asking and saying lord let your kingdom come okay we all understood what does it mean yeah yes yes pray uh, do angel delivery of our prayers like uh, to god in certain places uh, we see in the bible like angels are uh, when angels bring the oppressed to god and evil spirit or like fight with the angels to uh, is it the same applied to the praises when we praise god or worshiping god 
to angel uh, bringing our prayers to God, evil spirit can uh, try to uh, fight with angels. How can we confirm to our prayers to God? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. So your question is about praises. Mm, prayers, prayers. I think you yourself answered. You said sometimes prayers get hindered by demonic forces, isn't it? Uh, but as we keep praying, it will break through. And we see that in Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel was praying, um, initially there was a hindrance by demons, demonic principalities. But later on, God's answer came through. Okay, so that is clear. You're saying, can praises be hindered? Um, I don't, I can't think of any scripture as such where there's a hindrance to the praises, but we have scriptures that say that praises are a weapon. It's already a weapon. So when you praise, uh, you're defeating the devil. So you have to keep praising for long enough to defeat the devil. He will come to fight. Because there's a war, I guess we say, you know, it's a weapon. You need a weapon in a war, right? So praise enough and you will break through with praise. I, I hope that addresses your question. Yes. In the beginning, we saw the um, devil, devil also worship God, right? So I am asking, is there any chances to uh, devil try to um, destroy our prizes to God like that. He will try to destroy. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Praise in itself is a weapon. You know, the scripture describes it as a weapon. You read about it in Psalm 149. Okay, Psalm 149. Let me quickly give you that reference. Because the enemy comes to fight, that's why you need a weapon. And so when we praise, it's going to destroy him. Okay, uh, Psalm 149, verse, verse 5 onwards, it says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. So what it means is to release judgment on the enemy, we have to praise. Praise is the weapon. You got it? So your question was, does the enemy come to fight us? Obviously, he's fighting us. That's why we need this weapon. There will be hindrance. But as we keep praising him, we will overcome. Fine? All right. Great. So yes, we are talking about the kingdom of God coming into every area of our lives. And uh, we must ask for it. So it sounds like a very simple prayer. But it's very powerful to say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come in my health. We can pray like that. Then strength, um, healing, everything else will follow. So we can ask for the kingdom of God to come. Let's look at the next line. The next line says, give us this day our daily bread. So Jesus was encouraging the people to ask for their needs. Sometimes we think that it is unspiritual to ask God for our daily needs. That what will God think? Yo, this person is not mature. You're asking for, you know, uh, simple worldly things. But whom else can we ask? He's our Abba Father. So when we need something, we can ask God and say, God, I need these things. Bless me, oh God. It could be, uh, you know, 
anything in life you know it could be a job that we are asking for it could be um, it says daily bread here daily bread refers to needs it could be finances it could even be food it could be any kind of help small small things or big big things we don't know but if you have a need if i have a need nothing wrong to ask our abba father for our needs we don't have to feel ashamed there's nothing immature or unspiritual about seeking god for the things that we need and god understands god will help us right so ask for needs in our daily prayer we may have one small slot of time where we have written down lord i need this i need that i'm trusting you for this right and you start praying every day you pray till you see the answer to that prayer so all the needs that we have we can ask god for we can also ask for the needs of others so maybe people we know our family members their needs are there and uh, sometimes these are the burdens that we carry but we can pray we can say lord bless them uh, you release oh god that um, whatever that is into their lives so pray for yourself pray for others what is the next portion it says forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors again coming back to the our father part of uh, part of uh, the lord's prayer relationships are very important even god is teaching us that firstly we said our father not my father second forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sin sinned against us so as a believer you know we cannot carry grudges against people um i i don't know the exact quote but there is a quote um that that means that when we hold people in our hearts with unforgiveness okay we may think that we have imprisoned them okay they are in a prison we put them in a prison right they are in our hearts and we have all these ill feelings against them they are in a prison in our heart but the truth is the real prisoner is you the real prisoner is me when we have people held in our hearts with unforgiveness so how to have a successful prayer we are all talking about how to be successful in prayer simple things jesus is teaching us he saying look set your life right are there relationships in your life where you are being unjust where you are being you know you are not treating people correctly if you are not treating people correctly don't expect any answers forgive us our sins that we all know how to do lord forgive me for this forgive me for that i'm setting everything right with you but what about people we forget yeah okay leave it but jesus says no pray like this forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us so are we holding grudges against people is there bitterness in our hearts if that is there then also my prayer is not going to be effective how can i say god you forgive me but i am not ready to forgive anybody not working jesus is teaching us you want me to forgive you you forgive others forgiveness is huge when we talk about forgiveness there are many other things that are connected uh, i think there was one sermon preached only on forgiveness and the person who preached it wrote pages and pages there's so much in the bible about forgiveness it's important it's very important if i want to be successful in my prayer life i need to have a clear conscience clear conscience also includes forgiving others so don't hold grudges against people just the way we keep short accounts with god what is short accounts short accounts confess the moment we come to know that we made this mistake or the sin immediate quickly go to the lord and say god i'm so sorry and make a change that is a short account quickly we dealt with it 
But if we don't give short accounts, we are carrying it and dragging it. In the same way, when it comes to people, when I know I have an issue with somebody, immediate, quickly, the moment I realize, oh my goodness, I need to resolve the problem. Don't drag it and be bitter against people because it's going to affect our personality at the end of the day. It's going to only cause destruction, right? So it'll one day burst like a volcano. Keep short accounts. Talk to people and make relationships right. And that is needed for successful or effective prayer. So this is the next part. So even when we are praying daily, daily we have to think about our relationships and see whether we are living our life right before the Lord. And um, release forgiveness to people. You, how to pray this prayer? It can be as simple as God, you know, they did something like this. I feel so hurt, but I forgive them. I forgive them in the name of Jesus. I release them from my heart in the name of Jesus. I bless them in Jesus' name. That's the way to pray. And you see the changes that God is going to give you or help you with. All right. So let's move on. It later on uh, goes to verse 13, where we talk about not leading us into temptation, but delivering, delivering us from the evil one. So this is nothing but a prayer of uh, guarding ourselves. Where we say, God, I'm walking on the straight path. Help me to be on the straight path. Nothing should distract me. The enemy should not take me away. No temptation should take me away from you. So we pray, Lord, help me. Um, give me the focus. I put on the full armor of God. right? And I fight all the darts of the wicked one. I push it away in the name of Jesus. You pray protection. You pray for focus in the things of God. Any question? Yes. Why it's written that don't uh, hey, just a second. Yeah. And don't lead us into temptation. Yeah. Like yeah. why it's written it's a God we are praying to. Right. Why will he lead us? Lead us into temptation. Good question. So as we said earlier, you remember an in interpretation of scripture, scripture must be interpreted by scripture. So we have to check. Here it says, God, don't lead us into temptation. So we have to check from other passages of scripture if God has led anyone into temptation. Right? So let's quickly go to James chapter 1. Yeah, we will look at verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Got it. So clear. It's clearly saying God will not tempt you. So how do I go back and interpret what I just read, Matthew 6, 13, God cannot lead us into temptation. Why is it written in that language like that? That's another question. You know, literary manner of writing in some places, it may give a particular meaning, but that is not the meaning. It's so clear. If it says here that God is leading us into temptation and it says in James 1, 13 that he himself does not tempt anyone, it's contradiction. But how can the Bible contradict itself? So we are going to interpret Matthew 6.13 on the basis of James 1.13. God cannot tempt. So temptations are there. God protect us from those temptations. That's how we are going to interpret it. I showed you only one scripture today, right? But there are many scriptures where we understand God doesn't tempt us. He only brings us out of temptation. Who tempts us? Satan tempts us. Matthew 4. Satan came to Jesus. And what did he do? 
the temptation of Jesus. He's tempting. Who is tempting? Jesus is tempting or Satan is tempting? Satan is tempting. It's so clear. Two passages. Two passages are telling us that God doesn't tempt. So I will interpret Matthew 6 on the basis of the clear understanding of scripture. What is that? God does not tempt. The devil tempts. Mike, please. The, the online students are messaging saying we can't hear any of the questions. And the writer wrote this thing like, don't lead us into sin, yeah. into temptations, to interpret it. Like, so we can interpret it, or so we can like know the meaning of that sentence. Yeah. So the the writer who wrote it, right? We'll have to get into the Greek and other things over there. Why is it sounding like that? The point that I am trying to make is, in some places, it will sound like something. But we need clear passages of scripture to interpret unclear passages of scripture. We have just proved that God does not tempt. So I can't interpret this as God is tempting us or leading us into temptation. How do I? He cannot. He will not. He, he's already told us that. He only brings us out of temptation. Okay, so that's what we are asking him. Lord, you are able to bring us out of temptation. Bring us out of temptation. Guard us, protect us, and don't, you know, uh, just be with us. That's yes, yes, we are. Yeah, about temptation. Yes, yeah, about interpreting scripture, you have a full course. It's called hermeneutics. So you're going to do the entire course in the next semester. So you'll understand better at that time. Okay. Yeah, sure. OK, we've already run out of time. Uh, we'll come back, and then I'll quickly summarize this chapter, and we'll move on to the next chapter. Okay, Thank you, everyone.